This is a very unusual and a very special Sky at Night. It's our 50th anniversary, and we're going to indulge in a little time travel and go back to 1957 and the first programme, and then on to 2057 and meet Dr. Brian May on the surface of Mars. Well, I've been on the air now for half a century, and I've presented every programme except one when I was laid low by that wretched goose egg. The idea came originally from BBC producer Paul Johnstone, who wanted to put on a new kind of astronomy programme. He asked me to go and see him, which I did, and we worked out a programme to be called Star Map originally. Well, I'm afraid I can't show you that first programme because it wasn't recorded. But I found that my moon globe here is a very effective time-travelling machine, far better than Doctor Who's. So let's now go back to 1957 and that very first sky at night. So this is the studio as it was then. The, the big planisphere behind me, the old-fashioned cameras, everything was there. I remember so well, I wasn't nervous. I think when it comes to this kind of thing, I've got about as many nerves as the average rhinoceros. But I do remember thinking, my entire career depends on what I do during the next 20 minutes. Turn and return to your seat. Stand by, studio. First positions, please. Looks as though they're rehearsing. Q-grams. That music? No, that's absolutely wrong. That's got to go. No way. Good evening. Now, what I want to do in these talks is tell you about some of the interesting things you can see in the night sky each month. Astronomy is not just a hobby for old men with white beards, as so many people seem to think it is. Everyone can take an interest in it, and you don't need a vast telescope either. And now is a particularly good time to start because we've got some very spectacular events close ahead of us. And then after that I simply move over there and we continue. Very good. You know, it really is the old me, or rather the young me. So, how's that? All satisfactory? Uh, just a couple of things. Can you speak a little bit more quickly? Yes. And can we lose the monocle? No one wears them anymore. Hello, Patrick. Sorry to interrupt you. I say hello. Who is that distinguished fellow? <laughs> By Jove, it's me. Yes, it's good to see you after all these years. Um, I thought I'd come and wish you luck for the very first Sky at Night programme. We're well, recording the 50th anniversary of Sky at Night in 2007. We thought you might like to join in. Goodness gracious, 50 years. Quite, quite wonderful. I only asked for three programmes and they haven't even given me a contract. And you won't get one either. <laughs> really? Well, I must say they've given us a very good write-up in the Radio Times, but a dreadfully late time slot, 10.30 in the evening. I do hope it won't go out much later than that. Make the most of it. Things won't get any better there, I'm afraid. But 50 years on, Patrick, surely you must remember all of this for yourself. Not really. One forgets how much has changed. I mean, technology, for example. Indeed. Evidently, we've invented some kind of time travel. And I always was a little sceptical about that. But we are making great strides in technology here in 1957. The Americans have the giant 200-inch optical telescope in Palomar, California. But in Britain, we're completing the world's largest fully steerable radio telescope at Droddle Bank in Cheshire. Hugely exciting, but I fear rather expensive. The costs have spiralled to an amazing £700,000. <laughs> It may sound a lot to you in 1957, but it doesn't sound much today. And inflation has become really astronomical. Now, there might be. What topics are you covering in this first programme? Well, of course, we'll be discussing our neighbouring planets, but of great interest is a comet that's rapidly approaching. Comet Arendt-Roland was discovered last year by two Belgian astronomers. It can be seen without a telescope, and rather unusually, it has two tails, as you can see from this photograph. I hope you'll remind viewers that this is the only chance to see it. Indeed I shall. This comet, sadly, I fear, will never return. Not ever. Never. You mentioned the planets. Well, let's now turn to Mars, our most interesting neighbour. How did that seem in 1957? Well, here in 1957, it seems to us that the dark areas visible on Mars could be caused by vegetation, but plants have to get their water from somewhere, and the only possible sources look to be the Martian polar ice caps. Well, I fear here in 2007, we now know that there isn't any vegetation on Mars. Well, I'll just keep that one to myself for the moment, then. Now, tell me, how is your own research going? I know we both share a soft spot for the moon. Oh, yes, indeed, we do the moon, of course. I've been observing it very regularly since I was in the RF. Well, since we were in the RF. And here 
is my current moon map. Of course, I can't show you the far side of the moon. That's continually turned away from us. But thanks to the wobble as it orbits the Earth, we can just see around the edges. Now, I've been making a very careful study of those areas, and that's where I discovered this feature, a feature I call the Mare Orientale, or the Eastern Sea. A word to the wise, Patsy. The Americans will, will rediscover that for themselves. Rediscover it? Yes, I expect they will. Still, very little surprises me. I mean us. Mm. Now, our main argument about the moon centres on the nature of the craters. Are they volcanic, or are they caused by the impact of meteorites? Personally, I think it's clear that most of them are probably volcanic. I was wrong about that. Although I could be wrong about that. Now, another debate is over the nature of the lunar surface. Some have argued that it's covered in thick dust, so that anyone landing on it would simply sink. But that does seem a little pessimistic to me. I was right that time. And, of course, the entire green cheese theory, pretty much dead in the water. Yes, you could say that. Now, what about the neighbouring planets in our solar system? Indeed. Venus, a most intriguing world, almost the same size as the Earth, has a thick reflective atmosphere, so we know very little about the surface. I think there could be some oceans down there. Could be a sister planet of the Earth, quite possibly. Now and then it is just possible to see a glow on the dark side of Venus, which is called the ashen light. Some people used to think that this was caused by the illumination of Venusian cities. A fanciful idea, but I rather doubt it. <laughs> so do I. Now, what about Saturn, Patrick? That's a fascinating place. Yes, indeed. Indeed it is. The rings are quite, quite beautiful, as you can see from my drawing, um, either way up. Uh, the largest moon, Titan, a dot in the telescope, and I wonder what kind of world it is a visit. Probably a fairly barren, bleak kind of a place, but with Saturn hanging in the sky, my, 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 what an incredible view that must be. We know very little about the surface of Titan. Could be solid rock, could be ocean, or perhaps even both. Well, we now know there are chemical lakes there. Chemical lakes, my, my, my. Could they be methane? Well, they could indeed, yes. Very good. Very interesting. Time will tell, I'm sure. In fact, I suppose it already has done. Well, you know, I must say, it really is terribly fascinating speaking to you. But surely, in 2007, you must have all the answers. No, I'm afraid not. There's still so much we've got to know, but that's the fun of astronomy, and anyone can try it. Yes, I totally agree. So what is the greatest advance that you've witnessed? Well, surely that's got to be the start of space flight. Space flight, well, well, well. My good friend Arthur C. Clarke was speaking about this. He believes that we'll be on Mars by the 1970s. I believe the 1990s might be a little bit more realistic. I'm afraid you're both going to be disappointed. You mean we might not even make it at all? By Jove, the Astronomer Royal feels it could be several centuries before we travel the solar system. Well, that's rather too pessimistic. You see, what actually happens is... Stand by, studio. One minute to go. Uh, look, I'd very much like to talk about the future, but not at present. No time. We're on air in just one minute, and we're still undecided about the music. What are your thoughts? Well, he's been talking about using You Are My Lucky Star, but I rather prefer something more cheerful. What we need is a bit of stark Scandinavian introspection in a minor key, like Sibelius at the castle gate. Go for the Sibelius. You won't be sorry. Really? Some well, with the foresight of hindsight, I'm sure time will bear that one out. Tell the producer I wish to use the Sibelius. In fact, I insist. And a one last thing, oh, Patrick. Avoid that wretched goose egg. In 2004, it down there to kill me. Three. Look, I'm sorry, Patrick. I didn't quite Three. catch that. Was it important? Um, do you hope not. Here we go. Never mind. Good luck. Good evening. What I want to do in these talks is tell you about some of the interesting things you can see in the night sky each month. Astronomy is well, not just I'm glad to say the beard, time machine so actually works. Well, over the years, I've invited you all to join me at looking at various spectacular events in the sky, and I hope you've enjoyed it. A few weeks ago, I was joined by some friends in my garden because we're going to be a total eclipse of the moon, the best for a long time, and we were all looking forward to it. Well done, it's good to see you here. Thank you, Patrick. It's great to be invited. I have to say, in 2007, there's no better place to be than in Patrick Moore's garden, underneath the stars for a total eclipse of the moon. It's a dream. A lovely clear sky, I may say. Aren't we lucky? Chris, um, the moon is rather too parochial for you, but um, very good slips, I think. Yes, and I have a very firm policy on eclipses. I sit back and enjoy them and do very little. John, um, have you seen many total eclipses of the moon? Yeah, I've seen quite a few, but not so many with such perfect conditions as this. I think uh, there was one in 1980 where the sky was as clear as this, and on that occasion the, uh, the moon went a very dark red, almost dark brown. What about you, Bob? Are your cameras at the lady? Afraid not. Actually, uh, the moon's a little bit too close for me. I like things much further away, like distant galaxies, but it is spectacular to watch it 
uh, right now, and you never know, one day I might uh, be on the moon. Well, John, we are lucky, aren't we? We are indeed, Patrick. But you know the sort of thing that I want to do? I want to send some instruments to the moon. That's the sort of astronomy I do. And, you know, I think there's a real chance that we'll have British instruments landing on the moon uh, in the next decade. I hope you're right. Very nearly total now, and a most unusual colour. Kind of a coppery rose, isn't it? Something I've not seen before. It looks incredibly three-dimensional, doesn't it? It looks like a ball. Exactly. It looks like it's being illuminated from the side, which it's is not, clear. of course, but it mm. looks like that, doesn't it? It's like it's got a shiny edge to it. Yes. It hasn't got the drama of an eclipse of the sun, but a, an eclipse of the moon has got a, a quiet beauty all its own. It'd be wonderful to see. Well, um, that was our 50th anniversary in 2007. Let's now use our time machine and go forward to our 100th anniversary in 2057. Good evening. Welcome to the 100th anniversary of the Sky at Night program. I've appeared in all of the 1,310 episodes, except just once, in 2004, when I was laid low by that wretched goose egg. Just to remind you, I am speaking to you from the BBC computer. I was uploaded here in 2015. I'm really in a virtual nowhere. All the same, I can still bring you the programmes. Of course, when we began our programmes, the space age hadn't started. And the highlight of today's programmes are interviews with astronomers on Mars um, and, of course, the base on the Moon. Let's now go on a journey of about 50 million miles and go to Mars, to Paul Nell Observatory on Olympus Mons, the highest volcano on Mars. Extinct, we hope. And there waiting for us is the director, an old friend of the sky at night, Professor Chris Swinton. Hello, Chris. Well, what are conditions like on Port Lowell? Oh, hello, Patrick. It's wonderful. There's no light pollution and no smog either. Well, at least not yet. Chris, where are you? That's not Olympus Mons. Well, the hard work at the observatory hasn't started yet, so I'm continuing my own personal exploration. I'm here on the Isidus Planitia, uh, an impact basin between the ancient highlands and the northern plains. Now tell me, Chris, What's it like to walk on Mars? I always wanted to try it. Very comfortable, actually. Gravity's about a third of that on Earth, which means it's strong enough for us just to walk around, but it's weak enough we can still lift heavy objects like this suit relatively easily. What about the Martian air? Very thin, no real oxygen? A pretty good laboratory vacuum. That, and the fact that Mars is 40 million miles further away from the Sun than Earth is, means it gets very cold. On a day like today, it's probably minus 60 centigrade. It's certainly chilly. Interesting weather, too. There's one effect in particular. About midday, the ground heats the air just above it, and that rises through the colder air that sits on top. That rapid change in temperature causes a spinning air current, which picks up the fine dust and causes a mini tornado, or a dust devil, if you will. Tornadoes can be dangerous. We've had several at my home in Celsius. Yes, well, the air pressure is so low, these aren't much of a threat. Just entertainment to go with a lunchtime drink. I think you'd find Mars a pretty pleasant place to be. We've even started playing cricket. <laughs> You're lucky there, Chris. It must be great fun. Yes, well, on Mars, bowlers have to contend not just with the lower gravity, but with lower atmospheric pressure as well. It makes it really hard to get a swing on the ball, although it is travelling much faster when it reaches the batsman. The downside is that if the batsman connects with it, it's really easy for him to hit a six. It's a fine shot for four runs, then no mistake. <laughs> I can well imagine that. You know, I can see something very interesting. What's that over there? Oh, I was wondering when you'd spot that. It's the old British rover, Beagle 2, which landed more than 50 years ago. Do you remember? You covered it in the programme. Yes. Christmas Day 2003, but we lost contact with it and we never knew what happened to it. Well, we never knew until a few years ago when we rediscovered it. Sadly, it landed okay, but the solar panels failed to open. 
and that meant its transmitter never sent a signal back to Earth. Pity. It just might have made the biggest discovery of all. Yes, because it was looking for the direct signs of life, something NASA didn't get around to until 2020. So, Chris, is there life on Mars? Well, there certainly is. It's all over the planet. Um, you have to dig down to find it, of course. And if you do that and look on the underside of rocks like this one, you see this green material. And that's bacteria. Bacteria in a state of suspended animation, but bacteria nonetheless. All you have to do to wake them up is just to add water. Oh, that's time for me to get going. That means I've got half an hour of air left. More importantly, though, I've got a dehydrated bottle of 2007 Chateau Neuf de Pap with my name on it. Just add water. All right, Chris, a point taken. On your way. Also on Mars is another old friend of the sky at night, Dr. Brian May. He's at the European Mars base in Giusev Crater, where the spirit probe landed so long ago. And Chris went there to see him. Well, Brian, welcome back to the sky at night. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, uh, you've been on Mars now for, what, a year? What brought you here in the first place? Well, have a seat, Chris. Um, it's because the astronomy is so great here. There's no atmosphere to speak of, there's no clouds, absolutely no light pollution, of course. Perfect. I've been studying interplanetary dust, as you probably know, which was the subject of my thesis in, uh, well, 2007. Look at the dust on that. <laughs> yes, well, even in the middle of nowhere, though, Brian, you've, you've done a lot to make home out of your life habitat. Yes, well, I think it's a good idea. I think the most important thing I brought out here is my little old reflecting telescope, which um, me and my dad made when I was a boy. I've had some great fun looking at the, the Martian night sky with that. And uh, I also have Patrick's old 1879 Mars globe. Yes, he rescued that from a skip in Oxford, if I remember correctly. Yeah, beautiful. Good job, eh? But um, I do like to have a few reminders of home around me. Uh, I think it's important. I've been here a year now, of course, and I have another six months to go before I get back to Earth to get a new coat of varnish. Varnish? Well, not for me, of course, for, for the guitar, for the Red Special. <laughs> Yes, I remember that guitar from what? 2002, top of Buckingham Palace, and 2046, Lunar Live Aid. Yes, Lunar Live, what a great gig. Shame about Roger, though. It has to be said that using Apollo 11's descent stage as a drum platform was, well, a little risky. Well, yes, what none of us realised, of course, was that it was still half full of rocket fuel. So, um, after the uh, explosion, uh, we were all taking bets on how long Roger was going to be in orbit around the moon. Hey, Roger, we've had a problem here. He laughs about it now, I think. Well, I think. Speaking of bets, do you remember a long time ago, the 2007 50th anniversary of the sky at night? I do indeed, Chris, as if it were yesterday. Should we take a look? Yeah, that's... Well, is there life on Mars? Brian, what do you think? I would love to think there is, I'm sure we all would, but I have a sneaking feeling that we may be alone in the solar system after all. Why do you think that? I think it's my doubt that that miracle of the first step of life could actually happen more than once, that an organism which can't evolve can evolve into one which can. Mm. Well, Chris, what do you think about it? There's no life on the surface. There aren't any Martians walking around, but under the soil there's an awful lot of water. So maybe, just maybe, we'd get primitive life down there. I think we do. After all, Mars is not too unlike the Earth, and I'm sure there is a certain amount of life on Mars. Tell you what, guys, I'll lay you odds of a million to one that they don't find it in, inside 50 years. Right. There's a pound. You're on. Well, I have to say, Patrick did win, uh, because we actually did find bacterial life on Mars. So, Patrick, I'm about to pay up. Here's your newly minted one million pound coin. With inflation, it'll just about buy you a Mars bar, I should think. You know, I'd far prefer a brandy if I could drink one in this virtual state. Well, on the other hand, uh, it'll make a useful guitar pick for me. I have to say, though, there is something rather fishy about the uh, bacterial life on Mars. These little chaps are actually suspiciously very much like the ones we see on Earth. In fact, their DNA is identical to ours. So you have to wonder if they truly are Martian. It's possible that these seeds of life were blasted from the Earth millions of years ago by asteroid impacts. Mm. Either way, they taste great with chips. 
Yes, well, Brian, have you actually had any time to look at the Martian night sky? Well, I sleep every night, Chris. I can't resist it. From Earth, the brightest planet in the sky is Venus, the evening star. But from up here, the evening star is the planet Earth. And uh, we're a very long way from the Earth here, of course, and it looks pretty much like a star, except it's the most beautiful blue colour. You only need a little pair of binoculars, really, to see the moon and the Earth in your field of view in a nice black sky. And with a telescope, you can see the continents. And also very brilliant uh, polar caps. But, of course, these days they're very small. What else should we be looking at? Well, this is the place to see the zodiacal light, Chris. That beautiful ghostly glow which is reflected from the interplanetary dust. It's a little narrower out here, but with no moon and very little atmosphere, it's a glorious sight in a dark sky. Mars has its own moons, Phobos and Deimos, which are fun. They whiz across the sky. You can almost see them moving. As for the constellations, well, it's the same as on Earth. You'd have to travel a lot further to get any change in the positions of the stars. You know, looking up at Earth, that pale blue dot in the sky really seems a long way away. Mm. Patrick, back to you. Indeed. Chris, thank you very much. Now, we've looked back in time. We've visited Mars. What about the rest of the solar system? And welcome now to a very old friend of our program. A very old friend. And now resident on the computer of the International Space Station, Professor John Zarnecki of the Open University. Welcome, John. Well, um, frankly, you haven't changed much, but your surroundings have. Welcome, Patrick. I'm afraid we're going to have to be very quick because there's a solar flare on its way. It's about to reach us. In fact, there's already some interference. Well, I'll be brief then. On then to Jupiter, well beyond Mars, with this family of moons. One of these is Europa, with an icy crust, beneath which we think there may well be an ocean of water. Indeed, and we know for sure now, because we've got the Clark probe, and of course we designed the probe to melt through kilometres of ice. That's how thick we thought the crust was. But in fact, where we landed, it was only about 100 metres thick. So we've already got through the crust, and we've entered the ocean. And in fact, Patrick, I can give you a real scoop for the sky at night. We've done the first analysis of the ocean, and I can announce that we have found life on Europa. Bacteria. Are they at all like bacteria of Earth or Mars? Indeed, very, very simple life forms. We think that this is different from life that we know on Earth and Mars. So this could be the independent evolution that we've been looking for. What about danger to Earth? Asteroids, John. Remember Apophis? Indeed I do, Patrick. It was in the 20s, the 2020s of course, that we first started to do a really, really detailed analysis of the dangerous asteroids out there. And we found one, Apophis, about a mile across that seemed to be on a collision course with the Earth was predicted to hit the Earth in 2041. There were all sorts of plans as to how to deal with it. There was, of course, the well-known plan from President Bruce Willis in the United States, who wanted to nuke it. But we came up with a much better idea. We painted it black. How did that help? Well, you see, sunlight actually exerts a force on everything that it shines on. And that force depends on the colour of the object. So if we could change the colour, we would change the force. We used a black chemical, we covered the asteroid with it, and we did that about ten years in advance, and it worked. It just changed the force a tiny amount, and we've saved the Earth. So, in effect, it simply skimmed the top of the atmosphere, and passed harmlessly by. It was a close shave indeed. The interference is getting worse. Is that fair, John? It's almost on us. Patrick, I'm going to have to slap on some Factor 8000 sunscreen. You better be quick too. Bye then, Patrick. Oh well, I'm afraid we've lost, John. Can't be helped. Let's turn out to something quite different. The moon. Where we have the big new radio telescope. And the man who knows all about that is Professor Bob Nickel. And he's on the moon right now. Bob, welcome to our program. Well, Bob, you're a cosmologist. How have our views of the universe changed in general since 1957? 
Yes, well, it's a pleasure to talk about cosmology with you. As you know, back in 2007 at your 50th anniversary yeah. program. Oh, yes. You interviewed me and I told you what yes. uh, we thought the universe was made of. I remember that very well indeed. Um, let's have a look back at that clip so long ago. Well, Bob, um, what's new about the universe? Well, as you know, Patrick, since the 1930s, we've known about this mysterious thing called dark matter. This is unseen matter that we can only feel through its gravitational influence. In fact, if there wasn't dark matter, galaxies would just literally fly apart. And now, of course, we have the extra problem of what we call dark energy. It appears that about three quarters of the universe now is full of this mysterious material we call dark energy. And it's a pure form of energy in the universe. And this energy seems to be pushing the universe and making the expansion in the universe accelerate faster and faster and faster. Well, in that program, 50 years ago, we talked about dark energy and dark matter. We had no idea what they were. Do we know now? It does appear that string theory is the answer. This is a theory that says the universe is actually not four dimensions, but actually has 11 dimensions. Well, I know about four dimensions, the three we live in plus time, but where are the other seven? Well, they're somewhere in the universe. There are some that are on subatomic scales, and these uh, look like the dark matter that we thought there was back in 2007. Now, there are some other dimensions that are as big as the universe, and these are causing the acceleration in the expansion of the universe, what we called dark energy back in 2007. It still sounds pretty baffling to me, but at least we're making some progress. Now, what about this new lunar radio telescope? Well, I can actually tell you we've detected a very interesting radio signal. It doesn't look like anything else that we know about. And in fact, the International Astronomical Union is coming here to the moon to verify this signal, but it does look like that it may be from intelligent life. How far away? About a hundred light years. A hundred light years? Um, well, the first sky at night will just to reach them. And I wonder if anyone out there is listening to it, and if so, what they make of it. It's a new audience for you, Patrick, but will they be able to stay up late enough to see it? Well, depends on the length of their day, I suppose. <laughs> That's right. Well, the future is certainly going to be exciting. But now, for the last time, let's look back again to 1957 and see how my earlier self got on in that very first Sky at Night program. Five seconds on TK, coming to closing link, and... And we're off the air. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. All very good. Not speaking too quickly, I take it. Excellent. Nineteen fifty-seven seems a long time ago. Over the past fifty years, all of us in the Sky at Night have done our best to bring the sky to everybody. I hope we succeeded. And we'll go on doing that as long as we can. But what's going to happen during the next 50 years? Frankly, we just don't know. Good night. Well, back here in the present next on BBC One, highlights of the Cricket World Cup 2012-2013.